Good morning, Living Word family. And to our online watchers, you are so very welcome. And to any first-time visitors or new people, um, if you're here for the first time, please collect a little visitor's package from reception straight after the service ends. Thank you. And firstly, I just want to say on Wednesday evening coming at 6 o'clock in the chapel, we're having a special prayer meeting to pray for Israel. So please come and join us there. Or if you can't join us, please pray at home. Thank you. Um, and now to the messages. Um, first of all, on the 25th of October, we've got our ministry training open day. So if you're interested in studying further part-time or full-time, um, please come to that open day and find out everything you need to know about that. Then Monday the 16th of October, ladies, we have our women's encounter. It's the second one. You need to be there. If you want to make friends or just share with other ladies, that's where you need to be. Our prophetic encounter is Saturday the 21st of October, if you're coming for prophecy. And then Holy Spirit encounter, Saturday the 28th of October. It's the whole morning and it's always very, very, very special. And then on the 29th of October, we have our baptism opportunity, five o'clock for info, and then six o'clock during the service, it's a baptism service. And then we're into the fourth quarter. Um, this quarter we have courses, uh, My Divine Purpose and Word School. So you are still able to come this, this week, on, whenever it is Tuesday and Thursday, please do that. And if you missed anything, it's all on the Church Center app, except the Pray for Israel on Wednesday. Thank you. Enjoy the service. And here's Chuck. Amen. Well, welcome, everybody. This is not often I get to do an opening for the 1115 service, so I'm going to, to give it to you straight from where God is taking me. I'm going to give you Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. He introduces himself saying, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I want to draw your attention to the fact that he says he's a partner. That means a co-participant in tribulation, kingdom, and patient endurance. Now, it's interesting. He has three things, and they're not in order. He's got the beginning, the tribulation, and the end, the kingdom, and the middle part after that. Because one of the messages of the Bible is this. The path from pain to kingdom is endurance. Endurance. Endurance requires faith. Endure, endurance requires rising up and saying, I will not be defeated. Rising up and saying, I still believe. Rising up and saying, I will not bow down. I will not stop. I will rise up again. If you have fallen this week, and I, and I say this because last Saturday in our prayer time, uncharacteristically for me, I got a vision of this great horde of onslaught and, and opposition coming. And I didn't know what it meant. Only to find out an hour later, Hamas invaded Israel. When something happens in Israel, it seems like something in the spirit is going through even in our own lives. And if you've had opposition, if you've had some kind of attack, if you've had something that has gotten you down, I want you to now, well, I want all of you to stand up. But we are going to exhibit patient endurance by singing in faith, by singing with loud voices, by singing with to the Lord as a sacrifice of praise, saying we will not bow to the darkness, we will not bow to the violence, we will not bow to the discouragement, we will not bow to the fear. And even as I want you to pray with me over Israel, I'm praying over you. Are Rappeling. Abba Bashem Yeshua Hamashiach, Tiverech Otam, the Tiverech Otanu. Tain Lanu Hayom Malchut Cha. And that would seem Lir Oats Yeshua Cha. We want to see the God that is a warrior God rising up to defend his inheritance and to defend his people. We have your name upon us. Rise up on our behalf, even as you rise up in Jerusalem on their behalf. 
I thank you, Lord God. You are a great God, a mighty God, a powerful God. And we will sing in faith, knowing that you will promise and manifest what you have spoken. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us sing.
just thank you, Father, for everything you've done, for the work that you continue. Lord, we may praise you, have this expectation, a blessing for you.
Thank you, Father, that we can expect a blessing from you. creation cry 
just see the Holy Spirit moving upon hearts, winding up broken hearts, healing hurt, disappointment, especially also family disappointments. breakage in family relationships that God is healing, that He's mending and bringing you into the revelation of His power of transformation and of healing. Just as we worship, I don't know if it's possible, if we could emphasize the violin and the harp, if it's possible. I saw that just flow with a heavenly sound. And as you hear the violin and the harp and your heart responds to this word, just lift your hands to heaven and receive the healing that the Holy Spirit is imparting. I already feel it. It's coming. There it's flowing. It's bringing healing and recovery, restoration physically, emotionally, inwardly, spiritually. Yes, it's opening our blind eyes. It's causing you to see again. It's causing you to dream again. It's causing you to believe again. To believe God for the great and the big things. For the healing and the restoration that is needed. I impart and release through the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Healing grace. Healing grace. You heal and bind up the broken hearted, the balm of Gilead is smeared into every wound. Just receive. Just as they play, just as they play, there's a release of the Holy Spirit over this audience and even online. Just receive. It's yours. Take it. Drink it in. Receive it. Who of you would say something has happened? Thank you, Jesus. Just raise your hands and say thank you, Jesus, for what He just did. For the healing, the restoration, the transformation. Give Him honor and worship. He's such a good God. Such a great, great Lord. 
just hear this word from heaven. You will run with horses because you will be in my spirit. You will run like Elijah. You will finish your race. You will keep the faith and give Him praise. Give Him honour. I see a flag of victory, a kingdom flag of victory that says victory, victory, victory. It's yours. It's yours. God is breaking through new dimensions, new areas, new territories that you've never walked before. You will run with horses because God is your strength. Can we give Him some praise? He's worthy. He's worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. We praise and honour the Lord. What a wonderful presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Continue in that presence. Greet and love someone and then you can take your seat and God bless you. Thank you to our worship team. Wow, you've blessed us. Amen. Honour the Lord for them. Sure. What a blessing. Amen. Thank you so much, pastors. Who would like to worship God with your giving? Come on. Who would like to give Him praise in your giving and with your giving? Amen. There's such a wonderful principle in the Word of God that we find in the book of Galatians. If they have that, we can read it together. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. That's the Word of God, New Testament, confirming Old Testament Scripture that whatsoever you sow, you will reap. If you sow in accordance to the Spirit, from the Spirit, you will reap everlasting life. If you sow according to the flesh, you will reap corruption. Let the Spirit of God be the guide, the initiator that leads you into your giving, that leads us into our giving. Amen? So that we give from the Spirit unto life, unto multiplication, growth and establishment of His kingdom. And let it be also an act of worship and our end of thanksgiving. This scripture is so clear, I don't have to say much more about it. Just to encourage you, do not grow weary. Continue to sow. Continue to trust God. Continue to communicate with heaven in worship also as you give. Because God will surely in due season cause you to reap your harvest. Could you say Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Thank you that as we give and sow, I thank you that you are multiplying and increasing the seeds of righteousness, bringing forth a harvest in season every season season in the name of Jesus. Thank you that you help us to steward the finances, to give, do and sow as you lead us. And Lord, I pray that we would have testimonies of how you provided not only seed for the sower, but also the harvest that provides bread for the eater. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And if you've joined us online, you're welcome also to give There are multiple ways to give that are on screen. For you that are here, I'm going to ask the deacons to please take up the offerings for us. And then also you are welcome to make use of these electronic ways to give today or any other day as the Holy Spirit stirs in your heart to sow, to give, to honor God. You are welcome to do so. We are going to look at a video as the introduction to Pastor Marcus' sermon, and I gladly hand over to him. Thank you, Marcus. There is a kingdom that exists outside of the physical realm. It is not built on earthly power, and its nature is not worldly. It is a kingdom within mankind, set up in their hearts and souls. Its riches are spiritual, its power supernatural, 
and its glory eternal. It does not need weapons of this world or armies of men to maintain or advance its borders. Its object and design are not visible. This is a kingdom not of this world. It is invisible. To imagine that you are working and living in France right now, and your boss says to you that this weekend, or on Friday, the last day of the week, everybody is going to wear their rugby jerseys to work. And so I want to put to you, are you going to come to work in green and gold or in blue? Uh, and if the answer is blue, don't shout it out loud. We'll pray for you afterwards. <laughs> but um, I see there's some proud green and gold supporters here this morning. It, can I ask those of you who wore your Springbok jerseys to church this morning? I see one or two. Can you just stand for a moment? Let's just give them a, a hand clap. Do you mind? <laughs> Springbok's in the house. Let's just give them a hand clap. It's nothing to be shy about. We are citizens of this country, and we are proud to be citizens of this country with all its problems, amen? There's problems everywhere, but the Lord has placed us here on the southern tip of Africa, and it's a privilege to be part of what the Lord is doing in and through a nation that uh, statistics just came out, over 85 plus percent of this country, some provinces over 90 percent is professed to be Christian. And so the Lord has a plan for us and a purpose for us. A couple of weeks ago on Heritage Day, I shared a message around our spiritual heritage within the context of the kingdom of God. And today I want to continue on that message and build upon the principle of what it is to find my identity within the kingdom of God. What does that look like? Now, as I, as a South African uh, working in France, shows up, uh, at work with my green and gold instead of my blue, I'm going to stand out and look different because I am from a different country. And if people didn't know it before, then they will know it now. And so as a Christian, as part of the kingdom of God, the challenge that I wanna leave with you this morning is that do people know that there's something different about you? Do the people that, that uh, work and live and function your friends, your family around you know that you are a citizen of a different kingdom. Philippians 3, which is my title verse for today, is, but your citizenship is in heaven. Your citizenship is in the invisible kingdom, and from it we wait the Savior, Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2 says, so then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, outsiders without rights of citizenship. See, there's something that comes with citizenship, certain rights and certain authorities that is afforded to us as citizens of this country that you will not have if you do not have a South African ID book. On, on that uh, note, I wanna just digress for a moment. Uh, but it just fits into this message so beautifully that as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, we've got a different strategy and a different agenda. Unfortunately, in this country, we find that even when we work with the poorest of the poor, there's a political agenda. Communities that are the worst off in, in our city, unfortunately, are the communities that can't vote. There's informal settlements, and we've been involved in, in supporting specifically informal settlement in Kamildorf and also in, in Cemetery View in the east of Pretoria, where we've been involved with our congregation uh, next door. And 
every time something burns down or there's floods or there's problems in these communities, there's similar communities in Mamalodi as well, uh, all the political parties are shining in their absence because these people can't vote. They don't have citizenship. And, and even National Disaster Management arrives with a truck of mattresses and says, show me your ID book and you can get a mattress. It's unfortunately the reality of what we are facing, but we are driven by a different agenda. We are driven by an agenda to be the hands and feet of Christ. And we serve and love on you regardless of your nationality. In the last couple of weeks as the Lord has led us into these communities and serving these communities, the Lord opened up a door uh, outside of our traditional channels of provision and not even from a Christian organization but from a corporate entity uh, we just received this week a 1.5 million rand donation to do disaster relief and humanitarian relief in these communities that burnt down a while ago and everybody lost everything. And so I wanna extend an invitation to you if you'd like to be involved in this project roughly around Thursday. I'm not sure when everything's gonna arrive. We need to be purchasing this week. Uh, but we're gonna have to pack quite a few thousand food parcels and humanitarian relief parcels. And if you'd like to be involved with the logistics or just come and pack or serve during the week, there's clipboards available at reception. You could just leave your details there if you're able to serve in that. And so I'm excited for what the Lord is doing. And we find that when we establish a kingdom agenda, my dad always says that where the Lord guides, he provides. And if he orders, he will pay. And if we order, we pay. So it is safer to be on the side of where, the, where God uh, guides us. A couple of weeks ago, I was driving around with corporate bankers and, and sponsors and showing people around, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, I've actually got work to do. But this is what the Lord told me to do. And so he provides in the most supernatural ways. And so you are no longer without rights of citizenship, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, God's people, and members of God's household. I love this, just in the, in the Greek, we find this word fellow citizens and members of God's household. It's the only time in the Bible we find these specific words in, in the Greek, and, and literally all they mean is fellow citizens and fellow household members. The root word there for household is oikos, which is often referred to also as the body of Christ, or the church as a body, as a spiritual family. And, and what that word literally means is a member of the family, a member of or part of and fellow citizens of. And so you have identity within and a purpose within and a calling within the household and the family and the kingdom of God. Colossians 3 says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand, set your minds on the things that are above and not on the earth. Beloved, if you are laying awake at light, or you, even as you are sitting here right now, your mind, your thoughts, and your heart is focused on the trials and the tribulations and the suffering and the challenges and the broken relationships that you are facing right now. God want to, wants to challenge us and say there's an invisible kingdom with a different mandate and a different purpose and a different focus. And when you set your mind, your thoughts on that, all of a sudden, your problems look very different. My wife has a very beautiful way of bringing perspective in my life when I complain about the, the, the little things and then she'll always go like, eh, first world problems. There's actually people that are going to sleep hungry tonight. You think your problems are big, but in the context of the kingdom, there's a different vision. There's a different picture. And so we find that as we journey and we, we start functioning within this kingdom of God, we find identity in Jesus Christ. We find identity in who we are in Him and what our position and stance in him is. I love the scripture in Revelation 19 that describes Jesus and says that on his robe, on his thigh, he has his, the name inscribed, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
Who is he to you? Friend, Savior, Bridegroom, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the kingdom that we are part of and that we have been called to and that we are in relationship with is ruled by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That is the God that we serve. The only deity on this planet that is worshiped, that reached out to us first. Every single other religion. People will say to you, yes, sir, Islam is so similar to Christianity, we've got the same values, and the biggest difference between Islam and Christianity in, and every other religion is you need to do stuff to please God. You need to reach out to Him first. You see, He's paid the price for our sins. He, he's made the invitation. And I keep on saying this every week, I'm gonna keep on making that same invitation to everybody every week. John 14, six says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. And so if you are sitting here this morning and you are unsure in your heart what you are a citizen of, and, and I could just get uh, one of the shyest people in the room, I'm sorry I put you on the spot, but if I could just get one of the shyest people in the room to stand up proudly with their Springbok jersey and say, I am a proud Springbok supporter, I wanna challenge you right now to right there where you are, if you say, I wanna become part of the kingdom of God, I'm unsure, just stand in your seat right there where you are. Jesus says, if you will declare me before man, I will declare you before the Father. If you feel exposed right now, you don't have to. I want you to, to march into the front door of heaven boldly one day. So I'm a proud citizen of the kingdom of heaven. If you're unsure, I'm just gonna give a moment more. You're welcome right there where you are, just to stand up. I'm not gonna take too much time. Is there, I see a hand there. Is there somebody that would like to stand, that can't stand? You're welcome. I wanna just ask, for the people that are standing, if there's friends and family with you, if they would just stand with you as well. The reason why I ask that is that from this day, from this moment, you're gonna take responsibility to journey with that person in discipleship. This is a precious moment. This is the most precious moment of your life. It's gonna put something in your hand. I wanna invite the entire congregation just to pray with me as we pray together this prayer of salvation. Let's just pray out loud together. Jesus, thank you for the price that you paid on the cross. We choose today to make you our King and our Lord. We submit our lives to you and to your Lordship. We repent of our sins and receive your grace and become members, citizens of the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, thank you so much. Let's just give them a hand. You're welcome to take a seat. I say this every week. I know after 37 years as a congregation, we assume every Sunday that everybody is on the same page. But this is the most important part of why we get together the most important part. And as I always say, yes, hell is real and sin is real and, and we, we want to become citizens of heaven, but that is the start of a journey, of a relationship. And so I got married one day to not be single, but that wasn't my only motivation. Because <laughs> I'm on a lifelong journey of relationship. That is where every single one of us are. Whether you just received Christ, or whether you've been serving him for decades, we're on a lifelong journey of relationship. And that journey, 2 Corinthians says that we are in Christ, a new creation, and the old is past, and behold, the new has come. All of this from God, who through Christ reconciled us 
to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Blessed are the peacemakers, for to them belong the kingdom of God. It's the mandate that we've been given. We've been given a task to make a difference. If you show up at work and everybody's wearing blue and you're not wearing green, nobody's gonna know you're a Springbok supporter. What is it that you stand on? I, I can't deal with this every single Sunday, but forgive me for those of you who might have heard it 10 times already, but I wanna just repeat this. I know that oftentimes people ask me, what is it that you are doing or what is it that the church is doing to engage with government and specifically, and I don't wanna go into the details, but specifically the anti-Christian agenda within the CRL and, and the whole communist move that we are finding in the country to try and regulate and control religion. And we must understand that our approach to civil society and our approach with government has to be different. Why? Because Jesus loves the sinner but hates the sin. And so Jesus embraces everybody where they are but we have to stand on the truth of the word and say, but this is what the word says and we will not allow the government to legislate us out of compromising on the word. And so as uh, part of, and we are very privileged as a national movement to be part of the National Pentecostal Forum and I myself sit together with 10 other people uh, that form or represent, uh, each of them represents one of the, the, the 10 largest Pentecostal denominations in the country. Uh, I still don't know why we are part of them because we're not a, they invited us, but we're not actually a denomination. Um, but uh, together we sit and we engage with government on certain topics, representing over five million Christians. And so we have a voice and an influence in society, why? Because the body of Christ is united. This is actually something quite unique. We've, we only, in our infancy, it's only been about a year and a half that these large groups of churches have been working together and have found a united voice and has actually been making inroads and impact in having a voice in what is happening out there as opposed to people just speaking uh, you know, individually. The next question is people ask me, well, you know, are we, are we boycotting Willys or are we boycotting this business? And this is where I think us as Christians lose the plot, especially the Americans in the West. And I say this openly and honestly because I've had conversations with a lot of Americans around this topic. The moment we go to war with civil society, we are missing the core of our Christianity. Jesus wasn't picketing in front, of the, in front of the pub. He was inside the pub. I think he smelt every night when he came home of the stench, but that didn't keep him away. If we cannot embrace people that are broken and lost and be relevant to the brokenness and the lostness of this world, we have lost the plot and the purpose of why we are here. We are all on a journey. We all have issues. We all face challenges. We all deal with our own personal sin. Some of it is a bit more public than others. Just because I don't publicly walk around and smoke and, and drink doesn't mean that I don't struggle with stuff. This week was ballet concert time. Uh, my middle child had a, a ballet concert in uh, the state theater. And so all week I've been driving up and down, in and out of Pretoria CBD. And the fruit of the spirit becomes vegetables very quickly. When people push you off the road. And people walk in front of you when you've got a green light. And then I realize how unsaved I still am. And how much flesh there still is in me that I need to deal with. 1 Peter 2 says, but you are not like that. For you are a chosen people, a royal priest, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, 
you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You are reborn into a new family, into a new identity, into a new likeness. You might be, I wanna use the example again, you might be living in France and everybody speaks French, but when you put that green and gold on, you stand for something different. There's an identity that we find when we understand our purpose and our mandate. Identity of what it looks like to be reborn. We, we had a, our first, I was so excited about this, our first coming of age ceremony this week, uh, this weekend, uh, something I've been wanting to do for years. We find this in many cultures, uh, in, in our reformed and mainline uh, um, traditions and cultures and, and churches, we, we find this process of confirmation. And uh, a lot of cultures, like the Jewish culture, we have the bar mitzvah, or the bat mitzvah for the boys and the girls. Uh, in some of the African cultures, the boys go up the mountain and several days later they come back as men. And the purpose and the reason for this is that there needs to be a moment in time where identity is confirmed and to say to a young man and a young woman that you are now done with the things of a child and the whole earth revolving around you and you have now started on this journey of adulthood and being mature and responsible. And the purpose and the focus of that is that from now on, you are not the center point of your life anymore, but you take a step back and you start caring and taking responsibility for others. And as you do that, and you remove yourself from the center point of your story, something in the spirit happens as well, because you become a witness that can point to the center. Point to Christ, point to the answer. And so as we had the ceremony, I had the, the privilege just to share with some parents and had the privilege to have a conversation with, with a, a parent of, of, a, of a young boy that was adopted. And, and so the first thing that I asked them is that, did you legally adopt this boy? And there's a reason for that because in legal adoption, something beautiful happens in this country that legally, on that document, there's a beautiful line there that says, uh, where the parents' names are written that says, as if born by you. And then it continues to say that this child has full legal rights, access, and inheritance as if a natural born child. And so in the eyes of the law, that child is literally reborn into that family with full status and full rights, full authority, and full inheritance. Such a beautiful description of what happens when we get born again into the kingdom of God. Once that understanding of kingdom lands in our hearts, we can invite the Holy Spirit to come and work in our hearts and our minds and transform our paradigm of how we look at the world. The revelation of the word through the Holy Spirit you see, beloved, the word on its own is empty without the revelation of the Holy Spirit. It's just knowledge. Find a lot of atheists, a lot of Muslims that know this Bible much better than we do. It's just knowledge until the Holy Spirit brings revelation. Once that happens, something changes in my life. I know Chuck opened with a prayer for Israel. We're gonna close this morning again with a prayer for Israel, but I wanna share a short testimony. We've got a, a missionary couple. I, just for what they're going through right now, I don't wanna divulge their names, but they live in Jerusalem and run a clinic or in, they're involved in a clinic within the Gaza Strip. And so they go through that border every day and they, they minister to and care for something between 500 and 700 Palestinians every single day, and just in being real and genuine and authentic, and caring and loving for people, lead them to Christ. And so I got a few messages in the last couple of days from this gentleman that is serving in this community, and I am just overwhelmed and blown away by 
his kingdom vision, where the one moment he'll be talking about how he drops his child off at school and hours later, uh, you know, unknowingly of what's gonna happen, needs to rush back as bombs are falling everywhere and take this child that is incredibly traumatized with what's happening back home and they need to climb into a bomb shelter and people are being slaughtered and killed everywhere and the next moment he's pleading for us to pray. Firstly, for the Christians that are trapped in Gaza, hundreds. Right now as we speak, there's a group of 600 Christians that are sheltering within a church in the northern parts of Gaza that the Israelis are busy evacuating and they just, for practical reasons, can't leave. And so they're sheltering in place. We're gonna be praying for their protection. We've got a special prayer meeting Wednesday night uh, at six o'clock in the chapel. If you'd like to join that, we're gonna end the service for prayer as well. The next moment, he's talking about how we should pray for the Muslims, that they get saved, that they do not die and go to hell. And then he says, for our Savior, does not want anyone, not even his enemies, to miss out on salvation. Something has to happen in your heart in the midst of all this fighting to be pleading for the souls of your enemy, to be pleading for people to come to Christ. There's a different mandate. He doesn't talk politics. You can have opinions about the politics. The politics of today doesn't matter. It's the kingdom mandate that matters. I don't care what party you vote for. I care whether you're a representation of the citizen and a citizen of the kingdom of God. David says in Psalms 119, your word I have treasured and stored in my heart that I may not sin against you. I love the Afrikaans translation of this word treasured uh, for, forgive me for those of you who don't understand Afrikaans, but there's a beautiful word that's used in this translation that says kuste. There's something about just, I don't know if somebody can give me a beautiful word in English for that, but it's, it's just such a relational word. It's something that I treasure as a value, but also something that I love. It's something that speaks to my, my love for Christ that leads me to scripture and revelation, that leads me to want to be obedient to what God is doing. Romans 12 says, do not be conformed by this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That is the testing that you may discern the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. 1 Corinthians 2 says, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the Holy Spirit who is from God, so that we may know and understand the wonderful things freely given to us by God. The Holy Spirit comes and reveals to us and breaks open and shows us and leads us and guides us. John 16 says, but when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you in all the truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. There's this, this concept in, in the Pentecostal service, uh, circles that, that the prophetic ministry is something that's reserved for the prophets. And I'm not gonna teach on prophetic ministry this morning, but it's so important that we understand that yes, there is such a thing as the office of a prophet. And people that are called to different offices of prophecy. But we are a prophetic nation and a prophetic people as Christians by doing what? By telling what is yet to come. By testifying and living and exhibiting and being prophetic through our actions and our words. By calling the gold out of people. I don't need to be prophetic. Well, I am prophetic because I'm, I'm part of the kingdom of God, but I don't need a word from God to see that Julius Malema, before he was formed in his mother's womb, was called and purposed to be one of the biggest evangelists of our time. 
It's obvious. Now, is that what the world is seeing? Probably not. But when I put on my kingdom lens, I look at people differently. I see and I experience things differently. Why? Because I'm purposed to be prophetic. To do what? To see the kingdom of God on earth manifest right now. Live that and be that. We read in 1 Corinthians that we need to pursue this love with eagerness. Make it our goal. But earnestly desire and cultivate the spiritual gifts. For what purpose? To enrich myself? No. To be used by the believers to benefit the church. The gift is not for me. I am not the gift. I don't have the gift of healing. I simply steward it. When I pray for you and you get healed, you receive the gift of healing, which comes from the Father of lights. Not from me. It's for the purpose of serving and uplifting the church, but especially that you may prophesy. That is your mandate. Not, not to get a, a telegram from heaven about who's gonna win tonight's game or who's gonna be the next president. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about creating a vision for the future, about being a prophetic church, a prophetic nation. And if I say a prophetic nation, prophetic nation is part of the kingdom of God. I'm not referring to the nation of South Africa. Matthew 16 says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed on heaven. And so when you get born again and part of this family, that, that child, the moment he's legally adopted, becomes what? Part of that family with full rights and full access and full authority, full inheritance. The keys of the house. 2 Thessalonians says, therefore we ourselves boast about you in the churches. This word churches here in the Greek is ecclesia, which is not just a, a community, but it's a public gathering. A lot of what we do, we wouldn't be able to do if we were a house church. Banks don't give one and a half million rand to a house church to look after the poor. It's because we've got a 25 year reputation of work in the community work all over the nation, churches all over the nation, that we are able to, to have a battleship that can train and unleash right now as we speak, we're busy supporting a new church plant in the CBD of Cape Town. It's one of the most difficult places to plant churches. And I wanna honor you for, for tithing and sowing faithfully so that we are able to continue the work of God. Missionaries all over the world the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. This is the evidence of righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom for which you are also suffering. Love what Uncle Angus always says that faith isn't faith until it's tested. You don't, need to be, you don't know what you believe until you really, truly get put to the test. I did this illustration a couple of weeks ago uh, around having vision and strategy and wisdom within the midst of the storm. And then asked them to switch off all the lights. Before I did that, I said, did anybody notice the emergency exits in this room? Probably not when you came in. But if we had to, please don't do it now, but if you had to switch off all the lights in the room right now, the only thing you'll be able to see is the emergency exits. There's nothing that gives you clarity of vision and purpose when you go through the toughest times in your life. Ephesians 4.15 says, instead we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of this body, the church. And then this beautiful passage in 1 Corinthians 13 that says, love is patient and kind. It does not envy or boast, it's not arrogant or rude. It's not irritable, that's why I know I still have a long way to go. <laughs> it's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. For now we see in a mirror dimly the beauty of the mystery of God. 
One day when, when we get to heaven, we can ask him everything. Sometimes we need to just appreciate the beauty of the mystery of who he is. But then face to face, now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these love. Beloved, we as the church, as the body of Christ, as representation, as citizens of the kingdom of God, are at our prophetic best when we live like Jesus is king. And his kingdom is truly here and now. And we speak the truth and love. And when our actions, what we do every day, casts a vision that reflects kingdom values. It is when we wear the green and gold proudly, even if we're the only one in the room. There's a lady here that, I'm not gonna say her name, I don't wanna expose her, but that works at the restaurant that always comes to church, especially now over Rugby World Cup season with her all black shirt. And I mean, she gets a lot of flack for wearing an all black shirt every week. But she wears it proudly. Now, I don't know what's going on with her, we'll pray for her after the World Cup, but, but she stands out because she understands that's the team that she's chosen. What's the team that you are choosing today? We've been given a kingdom mandate, and I'm gonna draw this to a close. 2 Corinthians 5 says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through us. We implore on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He's called us to and given us the ministry of reconciliation. I believe Christianity in this world has something to learn from. The journey that we've walked. I've spoken to black rights activists in America about the journey that they are walking right now. And different wounds heal differently. I don't wanna make comparisons. But the Christian community in this country has, has made the hard yards has walked the hard road of reconciliation and we've got a long way to go. But as we walk that journey, we have something to offer the body of Christ. What an incredible privilege. I always say to leaders, don't get upset and dejected when people are, are upset with you just because you are a leader. Don't get upset and dejected just because people don't like you because of the color of your skin or what you stand for, or who you are. The fact that what you represent offends someone gives you the incredible opportunity to minister reconciliation to their hearts. That is our kingdom mandate. That's our kingdom perspective. And then Matthew 28 says, Jesus came and said to them, all authority, and we know this, this is the Great Commission, I've heard the scripture so many times. But I cannot minister this word without the scripture. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And therefore go and make disciples. Wherefore is therefore therefore? Because we have a mandate, authority from the kingdom of God to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold. We always leave out, I don't know why they leave out this last part, but for me this is the most important part of the entire scripture, is verse 20, that says, behold, I am with you always. Beloved, we don't do this alone. I tell you, try and lead someone to Christ alone. I, 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 I tried it once in my life try to talk a guy off a bridge that wanted to commit suicide. I spent three hours with him, I got nowhere. And then finally, bing, God please help me. Ask him if he loves me. Looked him in the eye, said do you love Jesus? He broke down in tears, committed his life to Christ. Five minutes later, next day he was in church. We don't do this alone. There's a gentleman in the city, I call him my favorite pastor in Pretoria, for the reason that he's the most authentic, genuine person that I know. 
has ability to connect in authenticity with people like I've never seen before. He's led thousands of young people to Christ. We have the pri privilege of, of him ministering here tonight. Uh, we'll be finished in time. It's gonna be a short service for you still to go and enjoy the rugby. But if you wanna be blessed out of your socks, I wanna invite you to tonight's service. A pastor by the name of Arch Bilankulu speaks seven languages fluently and he's just the most authentic Christian I know. Just walks around on campus and just connects with people. And invites them into the kingdom of God to become citizens of another dimension. Acts 1.8 says that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. You see, the thing is that when something changes in your heart, you cannot help but. I, I don't wanna go there, but I'm, I'm going to. I, I don't know who owns an air fryer. I'm not gonna ask you to put up your hand because the air fryer owners can't wait. But it's one, like one of those things, like anybody that owns an air fryer tries to convince everybody else to get one. Am I right? Why, because if it changes your life, everybody's gotta know it, man. Even if it saves you five minutes in your meal prep in a day, you're gonna try and convince everybody else to do the same. Matthew 5 says you're the salt of the earth and the light of the world, and in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and that you may glorify God. I wanna invite you to stand with me. We're gonna close off the service as we Meditate on the word. As always, all our sermons are available on the YouVersion Bible app. You go to events uh, after the Sunday. It'll be available on the live streams. There's links there if you wanna revisit. I always put in some extra scripture if you wanna meditate on this word. As we close off this morning, I wanna invite you to meditate upon the challenge of what are you doing as we reflect, and we're gonna end off with a prayer over Israel, there's an interesting thing that's happened in Israel right now. Under the, the Israeli, I don't wanna say the Jewish because not all Israelis are Jewish, but under the Israeli community. <clears throat> there's a large group of Israelis that have refused in the past to sign up for active duty and enlist, and reservists that have refused to show up when recalled because they disagree with the Zionist agenda, whatever their politics might be, doesn't matter. But when the war happened, all of them showed up. Beloved, we're in a war right now for the soul of the city, for the soul of this country, and this world. I'll leave you with this challenge as we end off in a prayer over Israel. As every single one of you, and we made an, a, an invitation earlier, so every single one of you right here is a citizen of the kingdom of God. My challenge to you this morning is will you report for duty? Will you report to your mandate of being a prophetic church? creating a new vision for a better future for your family, for your loved ones, speaking the love and truth, caring for the poor, make a difference where you are. Will you be prepared to stand out even if it means your persecution? That's my challenge to you this morning. And so we're gonna end off with this prayer, number 622, the Lord spoke to Moses and says, speak to Aaron and his sons saying, thus you shall bless the people of Israel and say to them. And I wanna invite you to pray this out loud with me as we pray this prayer over Israel, but also over God's beloved, over his congregation. And this is my blessing over you today. Let's pray this together. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lifts up his countenance upon you and gives you peace. Amen.
and amen. And then the next verse in 27 says, so shall they put my name upon the people of Israel and I will bless them. That's my prayer for you. Amen. Let's give God a praise. That's my prayer for you this morning. Our prayer of Israel today. May we make a change and a difference where we are. We're going to close off our online broadcast right now. For those of you who are with us online, if you'd like ministry, you're welcome to click on the links below. Send us a message. We'd love to connect with you. For those of you who are in the room, we'd love to minister to you afterwards. If you need any ministry of any kind, our teams are ready to minister to you. There's a lovely buffet lunch available in the restaurant or just a cup of coffee. If you'd like to fellowship and koinonia, just connect with one another in authenticity.